Hola, Pilancillos. Welcome back to the Offering Sacopal podcast. This is your host, Siva Masak. We are now on episode seven. Thank you all for joining me. I hope everyone is doing well and taking care of themselves, especially following Indigenous Peoples Day. Today is Chikwasik Yawit, which is six grain on the Mintana of Ochpanisli, which is where the wind blows all the seeds. So I hope that the wind is blowing many seeds for you as actually we're coming to the end of this Mintana. Today I want us to have a conversation that's both deeply personal and expansive, one that touches on identity, indigeneity, and what it means to be connected to our roots in a time of decolonization. Now this is a topic that has come up for me and it comes up for me all the time, just navigating these spaces as being a content creator involved in just in indigenous communities and, you know, d- my own personal journey and connecting with my own indigenous roots. And I thought it would be a great topic for today, following Indigenous Peoples Day. Every year, you know, we get a lot of the same messages, you know, trying to remind people that Indigenous Peoples Day is every day, yet we only post on that day. You know, there's so many of us trying to raise our voices, raise awareness every day. So it is and it is a movement that is growing. I did see a lot more posts this year acknowledging acknowledging the day and acknowledging some of the struggles that Indigenous people are going through today across the globe. And so I, I thought this conversation was one that is that is needed and something that I see triggered a lot in in the spheres, whether we're questioning each other on identities, you know, what tribe are you from? Where you like, where are you from? And do you speak the language? And it's sometimes it feels like you there's like pop quizzes that you have to respond to every once in a while. Well, you don't have to respond to them, but there people do come up with their pop quizzes. There is a growing movement calling people to dig deeper, to question where they come from and how they identify, especially within the Latinx community. The conversations around identity are complex and sometimes painfully judgmental. People use words like Chicano, Latino, Mestizo, Hispanic, Indigenous, or even detribalized Indigenous to describe themselves. And there's always someone around the corner trying to tell those individuals that they're not those things or that those things are problematic. It really does feel like jumping through hoops sometimes when speaking about identity. These terms are loaded and they are different for everyone. But what strikes me most is how quick we are to tear each other down over these words, demanding explanations as if any one of us has the definitive answer about who we are. Who we are is something that is fluid and is constantly in in a constant state of evolution. So it always feels like a weird or sort of almost pointless question to ask, who are we? Well, we're right here, right now. Is that not enough? And maybe that's where the real struggle lies. Deep down, so many of us are still searching. We're navigating the confusion and the diaspora of identity, especially as Mexican Americans or as immigrants trying to reconcile both being American and something much deeper, something tied to the land and to our ancestors. Even as repeating some of these terms, they feel weird and almost cumbersome in in my mouth as I say them, because identity is such a personal thing. We need to understand that these struggles are not our battleground, but actually our common ground. Our energies could be spent unifying instead of dividing, especially when there are greater existential crises to tackle, like the destruction of our environment, which affects us all. On my personal journey, I've had an I've had opportunities to rewrite my definition and my perspective on what identity actually is and having a conversation about identity as a whole as a way in which we relate to each other it's actually a little difficult 
because so much of my journey and the learnings on on this path, you know, through the cosmology, through the philosophy have led me to a place of non-identity and sort of peeling back all those layers and labels to get back to the core of who it is that we are and to move away from those distinctions that distinctions that ultimately separate us from from the land from nature yet these labels these identities it seems like they're inseparable in our quest or in our journey to navigate this world and it is something that is valued by society so it's very hard to completely relinquish it when navigating the social spheres like how do we communicate how do we talk to each other these labels help us identify and sort of get a bit of a an overview of who and what someone is but the reality of it is it's very one-dimensional as difficult as, as it is, I do want to dig into the reclamation of indigenous identity and the historical implications of the terminology that's been used to erase our ties to the land and to each other. This brings up another complex question. Are Mexicans native? It's a question that I see all the time, or there's a big distinction between the brothers up here in the north and the brothers down south, the (laughs) North American natives and South American natives. To some, this may seem like an absurd question. Of course we are. Our ancestors lived on this land long before borders and walls existed. But it's also a testament to how deep colonial erasure runs, that even our nativeness is called into question. Consider that blood quantum, a concept imposed by colonial governments to define indigeneity by fractions, was created to control and reduce native population. It's a flawed metric, one that ultimately serves the colonial agenda of erasing us. Yet, time and time again, I see it. I'm like, oh, well, what, what percentage or what are you, you know, as a quantifier to your native identity? Mexico has 68 indigenous peoples, each with their own language, for a total of 364 variants. The most widely spoken indigenous language is Nahuatl, followed by Maya, Zapotec, Mixtec, and Otomi. Mexico has the largest indigenous population in the Americas, with 23.2 million people identifying as indigenous in 2020. This is 19.4% of the country's total population. We know that colonialism wasn't just about physical conquest. It was a war on our names, our languages, and our sense of belonging. Words like Hispanic were imposed to assimilate us into a colonial framework, while mestizo was meant to erase indigenous roots by emphasizing mixed heritage. Each label has a history and with it a strategy of erasure. Unfortunately, I didn't have the opportunity, or maybe I did have the opportunity, but I didn't have the awareness to study this formally, you know, through through my undergrad. I I remember when I was in high school, we had we had Chicano Chicano studies, we had a club we had a club that we could join, you know, but it it isn't something that I joined. And in college, you know, I went to UC San Diego and they have a really big Chicano studies program. But again, it was, it just wasn't in my awareness to, to pursue that. And interestingly, I've always practiced my culture, my heritage in other ways through I think through dance and through art, really. And I've always remained connected that way. And obviously in my connection to my family in Mexico and all the traveling that I had to do in order to stay connected to my family. But I, you know, looking back, I do wish I would have gone through that formal education, you know, but I have dedicated almost a decade now to my own independent study and research and trying to catch up on so much that 
that I didn't learn that isn't taught to us, that isn't so accessible. You know, we we had AP European history at, at my high school, but imagine had I had AP Mexican history, uh, how how different and how empowered I would be, what different paths I would have taken. And those are, I feel, I, I feel that in those points and those lack of choices is where we really feel this part of this erasure. I remember back then, you know, when I was in my AP European history class, learning about the Renaissance, the Renaissance of back then, the art, the the explosion of culture in Europe. But how different would it be to have learned of the Renaissance of my, of our own personal culture, of our own land? And during those times, the 1500s, the Anahuac was rich in in history, in legacy, in civilization, and in, in in knowledge. However, let's not get too caught in the sadness, the grief of the loss, because right now, right now, we find ourselves in the midst of a renaissance. People are reclaiming their roots choosing to identify as indigenous, detribalized indigenous, or reconnecting in ways that honor their ancestry. However, this movement has also raised concerns among those still connected to traditional communities, the people on the reservations or the intact indigenous villages in Mexico. Many of them express frustration at the narratives being created by those of us who are more disconnected. Some voices rising on social media have gained prominence, often speaking on behalf of Native issues without having lived the day-to-day struggles faced by those within those intact communities. There is a real sense of injustice when individuals who have grown up disconnected from these struggles become the most visible faces of Indigenous identity. It's a really valid point because those in connected communities have experienced real systemic challenges. They face the scarcity, the discrimination, the loss, and the deliberate attempts to erase their cultures. This isn't something that all of us who are reconnecting have experienced to the same degree, and we must acknowledge that. In acknowledging this, it doesn't take away from also the sense of grief of being detribalized, of being disconnected, or having your families leave and immigrate somewhere else in search for a sense of safety, a sense of survival, whatever it is that the reasons in which your families may have immigrated. Colonialism, war, and violence have been a part of all people's histories. Now, this is a really touchy, this is a really touchy part. The history of Mexico is a testament to this complexity Even before the European invaders arrived, our own people fought and colonized each other. These conflicts were a form of anti-colonial rebellion against European colonial empires and settler states. After the Spanish conquest, indigenous people continued to resist European colonialism in Mexico and other parts of Central America. Some causes of revolt included forced labor, expansion of colonial territory, and forced reduction of communities into villages or missions, and encroachment on indigenous land rights. Resistance to European colonialism in Mexico and Central America has continued until now, until the 21st century, you know, we have Zapatista uprisings and there are people currently right now fighting for, for for their land, to protect the jungles, to protect their way of life. The Nahua people, for example, had taken over many communities and these negative relationships ultimately contributed to their own downfall when the Spanish arrived. It, this is part of how they say that the empire sort of fell from within it was it was their own people who no longer wanted the Nawa reign to continue and thought that they had allies in the Spanish and you know really they just put those people over them unknowingly. It's a very tough subject for a lot of us to accept, but it's also part of our own history. And I know it's more complex and I can only 
cover certain points, you know, as we, for the, for the purpose of this conversation and this episode, and perhaps maybe at another time, maybe if you find yourself, if you're a a historian and you would like to come on the podcast sometime and give us and and give us a breakdown of the history. I would love, I would love to talk to you about that. But for now, I can only share the bits and pieces that I've learned and, you know, acknowledging that there, that there is still much more to learn and that there is so much complexity in these histories that cannot truly be narrowed down to a few sentences. Acknowledging this does not detract from the genocide attempted by the invaders. I think that's a really important point. It simply reminds us that our history is complex and we must face all parts of it to truly understand where we come from. I want to elevate the voices of our connected communities today while also speaking to those of us who are seeking a way back, back to an understanding, a belonging, a respect for what it means to be Native. We cannot go back to the way things were. And I do see a lot of attempts at that, you know, people really wanting to practice something and how it was 500 years ago, but but we simply can't go back. It, it, we just can't and as difficult as it is to to accept we can't go back to the way things were but we can learn from our ancestors and create new systems for change and rematriation rematriation returning to the land rerooting ourselves in a way that honors Tonantzin Tlali Mother Earth and all her children We have a duty to heal the land and ourselves and to do it in a way that respects the unique experiences of all Indigenous people. I also want to address something that's been happening in the circles, the term pretendian. This word has been used to describe those who falsely claim Indigenous heritage, and it's a complicated issue. There are people who exploit indigeneity for personal gain for social status and for fame. And this exploitation hurts those of us who are genuinely trying to reconnect. And it hurts those communities who are still living the struggle every day. It's also important not to let the fear of being called a pretendian deter us from exploring our roots. If your heart is in the right place, if your actions are respectful, then your journey is valid. I want to share Cuauhtémoc's consigna a message that resonates deeply with our current journey of reconnecting and reclaiming. The consigna Cuauhtémoc is sort of like a prophecy, one of his last words to the people. Cuauhtémoc's words, you know, he's the last emperor in Huaytlatuani, Mexico, for those that don't know. But Cuauhtémoc's words remind us that even in the darkest moments, we must not lose sight of what truly matters. Our unity, our culture, our knowledge. His consigna speaks of transforming our homes into sacred spaces, ensuring that the essence of our temples, our schools, our and ball courts live on within our families and communities. This reflects our current struggle to preserve our traditions, our languages, our values, even in the face of immense challenges. In a time of forced erasure and colonial violence, Cuauhtémoc's words remind us to protect what is sacred and to prepare for the rise of the new sun. I will read it both in Spanish and in English. Now, if you haven't heard it before, I think it is an important inheritance, you know, something that should be heard by all of us. And I hope that you you really take these words to heart. I'll begin with the Spanish first. <laughs> Nuestro sol se ha ocultado. Nuestro sol se ha escondido y nos ha dejado en la más completa oscuridad. Sabemos que volverá a salir para alumbrarnos de nuevo. Pero mientras permanezca allá en el Mictlán, debemos unirnos ocultando en nuestros corazones todo lo que amamos. Destruyamos nuestro tocaltín nuestros templos, nuestro calmecame, escuelas de altos estudios, nuestros tlachcoan, campos de pelota, nuestros 
Tepochcaltin, escuelas para jóvenes, y nuestros Cuicacaltin, casas de cantos. Y dejemos las calles desiertas para encerrarnos en nuestros hogares. De hoy en adelante, ellos, nuestros hogares, serán nuestro Teocaltin, nuestro Calmecame, nuestros Tlachcoan, nuestros Tepochcaltin y nuestros Cuicacaltin de hoy en adelante, hasta que salga el nuevo sol. Los padres y las madres serán los maestros y los guías que lleven de mano a sus hijos mientras vivan. Que los padres y las madres no olviden decir a sus hijos lo que ha sido hasta hoy a Nahuac, al amparo de nuestros dioses. Y como resultado de las, de las costumbres y de la educación, que nuestros mayores inculcaron a nuestros padres y que con tanto empeño estos, estos inculcaron en nosotros, que tampoco olviden decir a sus hijos lo que un día deberá ser Anahuac, el país del nuevo sol. And now I'm going to read it in English. I'm remembering that this, was, this has already been translating twice, so I'll try and keep it as close to the essence as possible. Our sun has set. Our sun has hidden and has left us in complete darkness. We know it will rise again to shine upon us once more. But while it remains there in Yuktlan, we must unite, hiding in, hiding in our hearts all that we love. Let us destroy our tepok. Teocaltin, our temples, our Kalmekame, our institutions of higher learning, our Tlachcoan, our ball courts, our Tepochcaltin, our youth schools, and our Cuicacaltin, houses of song, and leave the streets deserted to enclose ourselves in our homes. From now on, they, our homes, will be our Teocaltin, our, Kalmeca, our Kalmekame, our Tlachcoan, our our Tepolchkaltin, our Kwikakaltin. And now on, until the new sun rises, fathers and mothers will be the teachers and guides who take their children by the hand while they live. May fathers and mothers not forget to tell their children what Anahuac has been until today, under the care of our gods and as a result of the customs and the education that our elders instilled in our parents and which our parents diligently instilled in us. May they also not forget to tell their children what Anahuac must one day become, the land of the new sun. Cuauhtémoc's words were, were said on the long night, and they serve as a reminder, they serve as a reminder that though those places may not exist in its physical form, they are, they exist within our hearts. And through the words that have been passed on through the oral tradition, what has, what has been passed on by your parents and your grandparents, there is that ancestral knowledge and DNA within you that is being awakened in these times. Because this new time of the new sun is, has arrived, it is here. We must remember that we are all here for a reason. We're being called back to these identities, these roots, because the earth herself, Donancintlali herself, is calling us back. The divisions among us are distractions. They pull us away from what truly matters, healing our relationship with the land and taking responsibility for the damage that's been done. Colonialism didn't just divide people. It divided people from nature. And that's the wound we need to heal most urgently. So today, I want to invite us all to reflect on the land, not just here, but all over the world. We are all native to somewhere, and we all have a responsibility to our homelands, to our Donantzintlani, our Mother Earth. Let's set aside our differences, the questioning and the tearing down, and instead focus on what connects us. We are all part of this planet. All people from all over the world were native to this earth, and all our ancestors had traditions that honored the sacredness of the land. I want to take a moment now to acknowledge the pain, the loss, 
the ongoing genocide and wars happening around the world. Let's take a moment to pray for peace, for unity, and for a path forward that respects all people, all living beings, and all that is sacred. In closing, I hope today's conversation has given you some clarity or at least a different perspective. I want you to feel empowered to continue your journey of reconnection. I don't want you to feel encumbered or weighed down by making some perceived wrong choice in this, especially if it ultimately results in you planting native plants, you know, native to your region, inviting pollinators to your yard, growing a garden, being an earth steward, knowing that there is no right way, that no one can tell you exactly who you are, but you. Let's focus on unity, on respect, and on taking the steps needed to heal ourselves and the world around us. We have a responsibility to the land, to our ancestors and the future generations. This is truly what it means when we talk about those seven generations, the ones before and the ones after. The answer The answers lie in our hands and in our hearts. Reconnect in a way that is respectful, centered, and true. And remember, this journey isn't just about where you're from. It's about where you're going and the world we're trying to create together. Prasakamati for listening. Let's keep this conversation going. Let's keep digging deeper together. If today's conversation has resonated with you, I encourage you to take action in your own life, reflect on your roots, reconnect with the land, make yourself a garden like I mentioned, and support indigenous communities in their struggle for recognition and for rights. Let's all be part of the change together. Please leave a comment if if this resonated with you, if you have a comment about anything specific, or let me know if you heard Cuauhtémoc's consigna before and how it made you feel in in your heart. It's I know that when I first heard it, it it vibrated something in me. I I, I can't really describe it, and um, it's it's been a part of what I think about since then. If you're interested in learning more, please consider purchasing my book, Tlatoli Oracle. You know, if you if you like the my perspective on things, Tlatoli Oracle is a it's a, a divination book. You flip through the book, whatever page it lands on gives you a message inspired by the Tonal Powali, by the ancestors, their poetic sacred little moments for you to reconnect back to yourself. They're, they're medicine that I've picked up on my own personal journey. And I wrote that book with a lot, a lot of love. I now, by the, by the end of this week, I should have my black and white copies for those that are interested, but I do have some colored copies available as well. You can also book a Tonalamat reading with me. These resources can guide you deeper on your journey of self-discovery and connection. Again, Tlaskamati, and I hope that you have a beautiful week. See you back here again next Wednesday. Amateos.